Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 648. For the 14th of March 2021, Richard Saunders coming to you from a wet and rainy Sydney, Australia. It's been very humid the last couple of days, so I'm not surprised. And a few nights ago, we had an almighty storm come through this part of Sydney with localised flooding and heavy rains and all sorts of things. But coming up on this week's show, it's the return of Maynard, Maynard Live Interviews. This week, and for the next two weeks, Maynard interviews Dr. Brad Mackay, the uh, down under, the embarrassing bodies down under TV doctor, GP, generally good bloke around town. Dr. Brad has written a new book called Fake Medicine, all about what he considers to be fake medicine. Lots of quackery and strange conspiracy stuff. And of course, if you want to check out the book, you can buy that from the link in this week's show notes. But this week, Maynard asked Dr. Brad about vampire facials, which I've never heard about, lithium, why people turn to Dr. Google, ozone therapy, and more. And Australian listeners may well know Dr. Brad from his appearances on our TV here in Australia. Following that, it's Susan Gobick from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Susan's going to be telling us about uh, the case of somebody who keeps well, kept believing in the face of all the evidence to the contrary. In this case, it revolves around a so-called medium, someone who claims uh, they can talk with the dead. Hello, dead, how are you? Hello, dead? Dead? An insightful and, uh, in some respects, disturbing report from Susan Gerbic. Then we have the latest newsletter from the Australian Skeptic. See what's caught the sceptical eye of Tim Mendham this week. Then to round off the show in the Trove segment, since we've wrapped up our series Into the Unknown from 1950, we're going to be looking at other topics uh, this week. It's biorhythms. Now, some of you may never have heard of biorhythms. They've sort of come and gone. They're one of the few quack modalities that actually have faded into obscurity. Uh, Sort of like phrenology. You don't hear much about that anymore, if at all. Well, biorhythms certainly had their day. They've sort of come and gone. Well, I can hear the birds going nuts outside the windows. What's going on out there? Maybe they're flying from tree to tree to get out of the rain. You birds, what you need is some nice sleeps. Go sleep in. Yes, from these cooler autumn nights, all birds everywhere should have a nice sleep in, I think. Stop twittering out there. But anyway, now it's time for me to run downstairs and have some nice uh, honey toast on sourdough. Yeah, sourdough bread, a little bit of cream cheese, just a bit, and uh, lightly smeared with honey. Mmm, sounds pretty good, sounds pretty crunchy. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Look, I don't know about you people, but when I read a book, I want a book that's got facts, I want a book that's got action, I want a book that's got it all going on. And in my first sceptical interview in over a year, I have Dr. Brad McCart. Hi, Brad, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you in person. Uh, yes, and congratulations and not... on the new book. <laughs> thank you very much. I've been working on it through the whole COVID season. Um, so, yeah, more than 12 months of writing it and um, trying not to get COVID in the meantime. Yeah. And I started writing it when... Um, when fake medicine was a problem and it just escalated after COVID uh, came into being. So it's even more relevant now than when I began. Mm, look, for people who uh, for our English listeners, of course, uh, this is our very own Michael Mosley who does uh, Trust Me, I'm a Doctor, except uh, he's a lot hotter. Brad's a lot hotter. And also, the other thing about Brad is that uh, 
you're not a smirker. Michael Mosley, he's a smirker. I thought he was a smoker. I thought a doctor that's a smoker. No, he's a smirker. You don't smirk like he does, and that's good on television, Brad. I don't smirk or smoke, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> and actually, have you got a new TV show coming out at all? Um, uh, not at the moment. So mainly on Channel 9 doing Today Extra. So trying to speak some um, some science and medicine into uh, breakfast television. That's a challenge yeah. enough Speaking sometimes. Speaking about fake medicine, you must get some great listener feedback on the Channel 9 show in the morning there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it, it's creating um, direction and making sure that we're yeah, keeping things on track mm. um, when we're talking about different health topics. Look, and there's a bucket of health topics in, in the book here. I'm just actually looking at the sexist medicine section here. Um, uh, look, I'll, I'll just read a little bit about this one. Uh, I found very interesting. Vampire facials, which we have discussed on The Skeptic Zone. This is an anti-aging treatment that's been promoted by many celebrities, including Glennis Paltrow and Kim Kardashian. Uh, and rather the Disgustingly, you describe it here where blood is withdrawn from your veins and then injected into your face after going into a centrifuge. Um, who would want to be doing that? It seems like a very strange thing. How do you get to convince someone to do that? If, I, if someone with a medical degree was offering that to me, maybe I'll think about it. But people doing this usually haven't, have they? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of people will go for vampire facials. They're wanting all sorts of anti-aging beauty treatments, and there's always something else that uh, that comes along. So with with this vampire facial, uh, it was sort of designed um, to be similar to um, what people talk about, um, like PRP therapy, uh, which uh, is often used in medicine, where you get your you draw your own blood out, you uh, use a centrifuge, um, get all of the red cells to float to the bottom of the test tube, and then you put in a syringe and then take off the plasma and then inject that back into your body so we've we've used it in the past with like knees and shoulders sometimes around tendons and there has been a little bit of an anti-inflammatory effect from doing that so um so with uh, with the vampire facials it's using that same medical principle but then tilting it on its head for more cosmetic purposes um, but some of the uh, some of the practitioners that have done it uh, have not used the centrifuge so they've just got whole blood and then injected that back into their patients faces right. uh, which just makes you look like you've been eaten by a vampire wow that sounds like something dr nick from the simpsons would do <laughs> exactly so uh, neither are really proven to be of much benefit but you'll probably get a lot more bruising and uh, it looks more impressive on your instagram photos if you're not using the centrifuge mm. um, but it, it basically um, gets rid of some of the the wrinkles by um, by causing inflammation and uh, and swelling in your right. face great okay look when in fact maybe you should just go to bed earlier and knock off the smokes well, yeah, if you decreased alcohol and, uh, and got some more sleep, you'd probably do more good. Uh, but some people do go back time like week after week because the, uh, the fix lasts for about a week. Wow. So basically just calling us, causing some local inflammation is what we really want, really. So you could actually just slap yourself around a little bit would, would do it, you know, just a bit of you. Yeah bit of that well often it's just the fluid that's in injected into your face oh. that's causing the swelling as well so nothing magical about the the blood that's uh, that's being look used. There, there are some very famous celebrities I, I i won't mention 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 their name um uh, you can tell when they've just had their botox done because they have the devil's droop on the eyebrows because it looks like it's been injected a little bit close to the eyebrows and just at the end where the nose is it comes down can you notice that as a doctor straight away like your appearance today, Maynard. Oh, if, if only. <laughs> if only. Look, well, look. I actually was talking to my GP about my dad, who's 92, and I said, look, do you think we've got a problem with dementia? And he said, look, he's 92. It's hardly early onset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, um, Alzheimer's and dementia is a big a big issue uh, around the planet. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah. Look, look, why don't we just put an anti-Alzheimer drug or colonizer inhibitor, whatever it's called, into the water like we do with the fluoride? We cured tooth decay, we can cure Alzheimer's by just putting well, whichever ones work or put all of them in so people can drink it. What is wrong with that idea, Dr. Brad? I, th I don't think we've cured uh, tooth decay with fluoride. We've certainly decreased the number of people getting tooth decay by putting that in the water. Uh, a lot of people think that it's a neurotoxin, which I do talk about in the book. Um, but yeah, like I also talked to quite a few dentists as well and, uh, and uh, had many, many different opinions and scientific studies saying that it was fine and safe to put that in the water. Um, it doesn't cause dementia, as far as we're aware, with, with fluoride. There has been some talk about putting lithium in the water. Oh, yeah. Um, so lithium can work 
<laughs> it's meant to be very calming, uh, but I think that there's a, a lot of people who uh, would be averse to having a heavy metal um, like yeah. lithium put into the into the, the water. Yes, because it does occur naturally in some areas, and they noticed a bit of a, a decrease in certain illnesses, and that's the way fluoride started, but Dr. Brad. Yeah, so um, we, we found that it was helpful for, for preventing tooth decay. Um, but yeah, it d- didn't really calm the masses from having fluoride. Probably cr- would create people to be a little bit more calm, a little bit less bipolar disorder or or, um, or psychosis with uh, with some lithium in the water. But yeah, certainly not warranted at this point of time. Okay. Um, uh, well, come regarding- on, Al- Alzheimer's drugs, because you can't start too early with that kind of treatment, can you? Well, uh, the, a lot of the treatments for dementia and Alzheimer's disease are like they, they only tend to work for some people and we're still figuring out who they work for and who they don't work for. So they're, they're very expensive. So it would be another reason not to put them in the water at the moment. I don't think the government would be keen to, uh, to fund that at this point of time. Ah, but they'd be buying in bulk, so it would be cheaper. <laughs> it would still be very expensive and oh. it would probably um, yeah, break down a little bit in the water over time okay. as well. What you're hearing, listener, is the every person like myself who, who never went to medical school even once, not even for the day, not even for the afternoon at the bar. So when I'm reading things like uh, PubMed, I go to PubMed and look at stuff, I can take away the opposite opinion because I don't understand what the words mean. Is this how some people have come to their conclusions in your book, Fake Medicine, by, but they've looked at stuff and just not understood it and not asked anybody? Well, part of the book is looking at like why people come to those conclusions. And so a lot of people will go and see their doctor, they'll have a conversation, they may come out confused because their doctor's not using appropriate language for them, um, and then they will go, then go to Google and start to look up things themselves. So a lot of people just sort of like bypass the doctor these days and just go straight to Dr. Google. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's like there, there are um, many, many uh, different um, searches on Google for, for health problems that are happening every day. Um, hopefully, people then back that up by talking to their doctor about it afterwards. Um, but yeah, quite often, they'll, they'll just go off on their own tangent. Look, I'll ask for, did you cover intravenous ozone therapy in your book? Um, I covered oxygen therapy, uh, but there, there are so many kooky uh, therapies out there uh, that I wasn't able to cover them all within within my book. Um, but yeah, like the the sort of like the theory about ozone is that you've got like well, like two oxygen molecules is good, three would be better. Um, so if you're pumping that into you in, in any way possible, um, there that's really uh, got got to be good for you, isn't it? Um, so, <laughs> but then on the reverse side, you have a lot of people saying, oh well, you're needing lots of antioxidants um, that antioxidants are helpful for you so the more antioxidants you have in your diet um, or in your supplements um, the better off you'll be and so it's really confusing with the with the whole sort of alternative medical crowd because on one hand they're saying antioxidants and on the other hand they're saying more oxygen in your body but people don't really sort of like uh, realize that, that there's that incongruity with uh, with those both with those two statements. Hmm. Well, people are always going on about big, uh, big pharma, but basically all this fake medicine is just uh, is this the big placebo, isn't it? Well, I think a lot of it can be big placebo. We're spending about yeah more than $5 billion every year in Australia on alternative medicines and complementary medicines. So a lot of them just don't do anything at all. Um, so some of them can actually be harmful for you. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of patients who have had problems with their liver function or they've had hormonal issues um, from buying things online or, or even just going to a health food shop and thinking that they're buying something that's safe and effective and it's really screwing with their hormones completely. So there, there is this sort of like belief um, that what you're getting from a health food shop or what you're getting online must be like safe and fine for you. Um, it might work, it might not. Um, but there, there is also like 10, more than 10,000 products that are available every year on Australian shelves. So this is on pharmacies and also in health food shops um, available, which haven't been tested. So a lot of the, a lot of the problems are with the with the TGA that it's a, a knee-jerk reaction. So once there's a complaint made, then they might look at the product. Um, but to actually get it on the shelf and sell it in Australia, the company has to just have information that it does what they say it does and contains what they say it contains. There's no testing of those products before they go go out there. Well, a classic example, in the early 90s, I was getting lysine complex from to allegedly help me sleep, and maybe it does, I'm not quite sure, um, from a health food place, and it just disappeared off the shelf. But before it disappeared off the shelf, I was having 
aches and pains in all my joints except my knees. I was almost crippled up and everything. I went to see Professor Penny, the immunologist. He couldn't find anything wrong with me. There was nothing going on. What it was, the worldwide supply that Japan had been contaminated with strychnine. I was actually taking large doses of strychnine with my lysine complex. And I thought a immunologist would test for that kind of thing, but he, he I don't think, he, I don't, th self-poisoning was not one of the things an immunologist normally tests for, and yeah, and he couldn't figure it out, so, uh, so that can happen, and it has, and I remember I was annoyed when I went to the health shop, well, how dare the government not let me have my IC in conflict, because no one had told me to be, I found out 10 years later it was contaminated like that, so that can happen. Yeah, I had a patient a while ago who was taking bon soy, so just a, a regular soy milk oh, yes. substitute, so just trying to get away from dairy products, and then, um, yeah, t totally um, screwed up their thyroid hormone. And so what they were finding was that there were extra um, extra concentrations of, of iodine within the, the soy milk. And so this was, yeah, like making people all, all across Australia and, uh, and other countries um, just having, like, hyperthyroidism because they were giving themselves like large doses of iodine. So this so, does happen all, all the time. So is that making them sleepy or overactive? Um, o overactive and tired and uh, losing lots of weight and feeling really irritable and would explain a lot of people's anxiety at the time. That, it, that explains Twitter completely. <laughs> you mean there's, there's people being a bit tetchy on Twitter? Look, check out the soy milk. <laughs> De Go definitely. On. Well, look, I'm having a great time having a chat here. Look, can I come back to your ha house next time, have some more of the coffee, um, uh, get some of that, that some of the cash that's lying around the front room, which is great, because you don't see that in houses these days. It's all cards. You can't do anything with it. And meet your dog again. Can I go back ne next week and talk about fake medicine again? Um, Humphrey will be very pleased to see you, and uh, we'll get you something more than dog biscuits next week. Great. The, the book's available everywhere. And are you going on tour with fake medicine? Will there be the fake medicine tour? Which, who knows, you might get anti-vaxxers turning up. Oh, yeah, man! Yeah, yeah. I can only hope that anti-vaxxers would turn up to a book launch. Uh, we'll hopefully have a book <laughs> launch in April. Uh, we're, we're planning it at the moment. Uh, you can buy the book on Booktopia and Amazon. Um, and, yeah, just look up um, Dr. Brad Mackay, my beautiful name, and uh, fake medicine, and you'll be able to find it online. Oh, and of course, there'll be a link to that in the show notes. Go, go have a look there right now. Have a look, go. Hello, this is Rob Palmer. You may have heard of me. Lately, I've been interviewing scientists, skeptics, and other critical thinkers from around the world for my column in the Skeptical Inquirer, and recently, some for the Skeptic Zone. My written interviews have included Jay Novella from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, mass psychogenic illness expert Robert Bartholomew, Celestial Ward from Squaring the Strange, psychic busting Private I, Bob Nygaard, skeptical activist Michael Marshall of the UK, and even secular activists Bailey Harris and Jean Delancey, that's Q from Star Trek. I even interviewed, believe it or not, a magic dragon. And another really well-known skeptic, Richard Saunders. You can find my online column with these interviews and more by Googling The Well-Known Skeptic plus Skeptical Inquirer. Also, follow me on Facebook at The Well-Known Skeptic. Cheers. think we need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic. Hello, Skeptic Zone listeners. It is Susan Gerbic from the Gorilla Skeptics Projects. And I wanted to tell you just, oh, this story about Kin, who was uh, somebody that I found on YouTube who had uploaded a video of a reading he had had with Thomas John, the grief vampire that I write so much about. Ken had an in-person reading with Thomas John a few years ago and I wrote about this on an article for Skeptical Inquirer called Thomas John and the Believers and it's from October 9th, 2019 and I'll, I'll give it to Richard so he can put it in the show notes in case you're interested in reading more about it. But the question had come up 
with some a conversation I was having with someone today about, you know, if you were to show somebody with as much fact as possible, I mean, like right here, here's the evidence that this psychic is cheating and reading your hot, doing a hot reading and, and looking at your Facebook page and your social media, would they believe? Would they just go, oh my gosh, you're right, he's a fraud. Well, you know, sometimes <laughs> there's more to it than that. I found this YouTube video that this guy Ken had put up. As I said, it was seven minutes long. It's in-person reading. It was a show that Ken had gone to. So it was just audio. It was an event that Thomas John had advertised on his own Facebook. As I'm listening to this recording, and it had maybe 10 or 15 views, so it wasn't really a, a big video or anything really super important. I mean, it was important to Ken, obviously. As I was listening to it, you know, it had all the typical hallmarks of hot read where, you know, some very specific things like somebody's name or something that could be easily found on a Facebook page. And I did. I went over to his Facebook page as well as a couple of my team members and we were looking through his Facebook page and it was really obvious that they were some of the most recent postings uh, at the time that this video was uploaded that somebody could be looking at the Facebook page and then just relaying what was there, something about a car being sold, um, something about military uh, awards, and um, a mention of somebody named Anna. That perplexed us for a couple minutes, but we went and did a Google search, and we found the obituary that shows Anna was married to Ken's father years and years ago. She died a long time ago. That was in an obituary. It wasn't really hard. It wasn't on Facebook, but it was on, on an obit. And so, <laughs> you know, in the comment section of this YouTube video, Ken had said some question about like, you know, it's real, you know, and, and don't you all think it's real? So I felt like, okay, I'm going to reach out to this guy. And I did on Facebook and I told him that I'm researching hot reading. And um, I'm curious about the reading he had received from Thomas John. I said, you know, some time has passed. Do you still think that it was a legitimate reading and that he wasn't reading your Facebook page back to you. And Ken said, oh, no, absolutely. It was real. And I, I, of course, it was real. He was speaking to my dead family members and so on. And I said, well, look at your Facebook page. And I shared with him the screenshots we had taken. And I said, look, here's the car. Here's this. Here's that. And he's like, no, no. Um, Thomas John was getting at the at the reasons behind the car being sold and and the pain that we were thinking of selling this car and you know we're conflicted about it and how we should sell or not sell it was you know really weighing on our minds and i said really and i went back and listened to the video again and nope that's not really what was going on what was going on was thomas john just said dad is okay with selling the car <laughs> i'm like well that's okay, yeah, but, you know, if you're looking at his Facebook page, that's not saying much, you know, that's not really pulling up a lot of things. Well, so I asked Ken, I said, well, what could I show you that would really convince you that this man is reading your Facebook page or, you know, the uh, social media posts? And, you know, keep in mind that possibly the dead are reading the Facebook pages and relaying it to Thomas John and Thomas John is then say, getting it from the spirit and then relaying it back to Ken. But that's kind of a confusing way of doing it. Seems like it'd be much easier just to go directly to Facebook. But you know, what do I know? I'm not psychic. But I asked him, I said, so what would really be something I could show you to prove to you that he is looking you up? And he says, well, the Anna thing, because, you know, there's no way Anna's on my Facebook page. I'm like, fair enough. Here's the obituary for your dad. And it shows that he's preceded in his death by his wife, Anna, who died many years before. There you go. And Ken's like, no, no, that's that. No, that can't be it. And I said, well, Ken tells me there's no way Thomas John could have known I was at the event that I was going to be at that event to look at my Facebook page, to be able to look and do an in-depth look at my social media because my stepsister bought the tickets and she doesn't have the same name 
and we're not even connected on Facebook or anything. So he wouldn't know I was going to be there. And once we got there, he didn't obviously know because, you know, I didn't even buy a ticket. He didn't know my name. So I said, you know, you got me there. So how could Thomas John have known you were going to be at this event if you didn't buy the ticket? It's not in your name. It's not using your credit card. And once you got there, you didn't fill out any papers or anything like that that gave away your name. And he's like, no, no. So there's no way he could have known I was going to be there. So definitely he had to be talking to my family members. So forget about the social media stuff. He couldn't have been looking at it because he didn't know to look for it. And, you know, I thought you're absolutely right. So in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking he's, he's speaking to the dead or anything like that. Still, it wasn't convincing enough. But I thought to myself, there's something I'm missing. And I just set it aside for a little bit. And one of my team members who's, who's uh, really good at this kind of stuff, um, he went over and he says, you know, I think I figured it out. And he says, no, I know I figured it out. And so what my team member did, so Thomas John had posted the event on Thomas John's Facebook page saying, I'm having this event on this day, buy your tickets, blah, blah, blah. So my team member looked at that thread and inside the thread, part of the way down, there is Ken posting. Here's what it says. I'm going to read it verbatim. I just ordered tickets for this event, excited. However, I realized after my credit card approved, I misspelled my email address. Dang it. And then Thomas John responds, email us the, um, your information. I'll make sure we can fix this error. <laughs> I'm looking right at it. I got a nice screenshot of it. There's Ken's Facebook page right there in front and he's responding to an event on a day. So Thomas John knows Ken is going to attend. Thomas John knows what day he's going to attend. And Ken's Facebook page with all his posts showing all the things that Thomas John relayed to him are right there on the page. There is no missing it. And I said to myself, Ken just lied to me. He lied. He absolutely lied to me. I mean, <laughs> really? And I so I reached out to Ken again. And I said, hey, Ken, I didn't say you lied. I didn't want to go there. I said, so can you explain this screenshot to me? You told me that you didn't buy the ticket, that you had no contact with Thomas John, and there's no way Thomas John could have known you were at the event. But here you are posting on his, his event page with your Facebook page. And Ken wrote me back. And he said, just a good feeling for me that I choose to follow. I am close to death myself and I very much want to feel good. And that he, and he went on to say he had multiple health issues, medical issues, and, and it's leaving him with very bad thoughts. So he wanted to believe that Thomas John was speaking to his family members because he felt like he was nearing death himself. And... I said to myself, wow, you know, you could show them proof that they're being cheated and lied to. And some people are so desperate that they are willing to close their eyes and just say, don't tell me more. I don't want to know that he's cheating me and, and this is a lie. I just don't because, you know, of reasons. And I thought, okay, fair enough. He's an adult. He can do what he wants. But I felt horrible for Ken. I really did. I felt like, you know, here's a guy with a giant sign on his back that says, you know, I, I could be cheated. Just go ahead and take advantage of me. I don't care. Just take my money. You know, <laughs> it was really sad. He's a, it just felt like he was somebody that they, they're just going to prey on him. You know, a grief vampire for sure is going to take advantage of this guy. Just manipulating emotions, manipulating the situation for for money, power, whatever. Anyway, it's pretty sad. But I want to leave you with this story because I think it's an interesting way of looking at the psychology behind this. That 
people, some people are going to believe, you know, whether we prove it to them or not, there's just nothing you can do in that case. But I think it was an interesting look at it. And um, I don't want to be a downer or anything like that. So, you know, uh, this article will be up on the show notes for Skeptic Zone. Maybe after this, you should take your dog for a walk or something or watch some kitten or puppy videos. But <laughs> this is the world we live in. Thanks all. from the Data Skeptic Podcast. If you're curious about the way data is changing our world, topics like AI and all this craziness with Facebook and bots and the Twitter storm and how the algorithms that underline that work, uh, and you don't want a technical deep dive, you want it you know, in the vernacular in a way that people can understand, check us out at Data Skeptic. That's what we try and do. I interview advanced professionals in the field who do this sort of research, and then I get into interesting projects as well. We're a weekly show, and you can find us at dataskeptic.com. The Australian Skeptics News Letter No. 118, written and compiled by Tim Bendham. Hi all, it says, the usual mix of the interesting, concerning and strange. Fear and uncertainty about COVID has given an opportunity for opportunists to pitch their message and or their products to help you cope thus creating more fear and uncertainty and inevitable dangers. Critical thinking is seen as a weapon to fight this, and it's good to see it slowly in the creeping in schools, even in Nigeria, where superstition is prone and protected. Read on. And each of the following items is also accompanied by a link to the full article when you... Uh, subscribe to the newsletter and of course you can do that at skeptics.com.au and have this delivered into your inbox every other week kiwi xmp promotes anti-5g supplements former high-ranking new zealand national mp jamie lee ross is behind a company planning to sell a nutritional supplement claiming to protect users from electromagnetic radiation. The supplement, called Presidium, was developed by Dr. Marco Ruggiero, an Italian microbiologist known for promoting pseudoscientific treatments. His other products include a microbiotic yogurt said to treat a range of conditions including autism and AIDS, and a pill purported to reverse aging and, quote, extend life to unimagined lengths, end quote. This is part of a growing industry of pseudoscientific medical treatments that have flourished in New Zealand amid the rise of online misinformation and conspiracy theories. Clive Palmer's COVID vaccine ad factually wrong. A full-page advertisement signed by Clive Palmer in The Australian, which is a newspaper, questioning COVID-19 vaccination Quote, contains factual inaccuracies, end quote, the TGA says. That's the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The advertisement claimed that authorities gave permission for the emergency use of COVID-19 vaccines, except there is no such thing as, quote, emergency use authorization, end quote, for COVID-19 vaccines in Australia. Far-right extremists recruiting wellness groups and anti-vaxxers. Victoria police say that far-right extremist groups are drawing in new members from the wellness and anti-vaxxer communities online 
using the COVID pandemic and outrage over state border closures as a, quote, recruiting tool, end quote, to swell their ranks. In submissions to a federal parliamentary inquiry into extremism, national security agencies report children as young as 13 are joining right-wing extremist groups which are getting more sophisticated. Quote, They see the pandemic as proof of the failure of globalization, multiculturalism and democracy and confirmation that social collapse and a race war are inevitable, end quote, said the Australian Security Intelligence Organization in its submission. Americans are the most negative about 5G. Based on online searches in relation to 5G, UK-based prolifics testing used online analytics tool Ahrefs to discover which countries in the world are the most negative of the technology. As an aside, the report actually says skeptical, but that's not us. Thank you for that uh, clarification, Tim. It classified and grouped consistently recurring Google searches by individuals on 5G, such as, is 5G dangerous? Is 5G safe? Is 5G harmful? Does 5G pose health risks? And does 5G cause slash spread coronavirus, COVID-19, end quote. As online searches about 5G, it found that the United States is in the number one spot as Americans are the most hesitant about the emerging technology. With 374,700 skeptical online searches regarding 5G each month. In second position is the UK with 93,400 searches a month, and Australia in third place with 32,970 searches. Although on a per capita basis, that would put UK first and Australia second. At the other end, in 20th place, is Denmark with an average of 1,410 searches per month. Teaching critical thinking in Nigeria. Indefatigable skeptic and rationalist Leo Igwe reports that after a long-running campaign, Nigerian authorities are beginning to allow the teaching of critical thinking in schools. Quote, I received a letter from the Oyo State Universal Basic Education Board granting us permission to organize critical thinking workshops and introduce critical thinking books into primary schools in the state, end quote, he says. Quote, Oyo State is the first state in Nigeria to grant this permission, end quote. So some good news there coming out of Africa. Other items here say a movie interlude, 15 things you didn't know about Bigfoot. A feature-length comedy follows a hopelessly millennial reporter on the most important assignment of his career, Bigfoot. But after following a prominent cryptozoologist into the Appalachian foothills, he's forced to answer the question, quote, is a good story worth dying for, end quote. A mockumentary take on social media and clickbait reality journalism. Now there's a link for the trailer and the movie opens in May. The newsletter goes on to advise that the new issue or the next issue of The Skeptic, the journal from Australian Skeptics, will be out very soon. In fact, the digital copies are already with subscribers, and I can attest to that because I received mine just a few days ago in the email. It has a major feature on various mind control techniques and the pseudoscience behind them. Also included are an in-depth look at biodynamics, a study on omens and prophecies, and a classic map of early Australia exploration reinterpreted, contact with extraterrestrials, and the early results of a major study on psychic predictions. Who's right, who's wrong, and who's jumped onto the wrong horse. Also in the newsletter, an overview of upcoming events, including events from Queensland, the Queensland Skeptics, the Canberra Skeptics, the Vic Skeptics Cafe, Gold Coast Skeptics, Perth Skeptics, Adelaide, and Sydney. Now there's much more to read in the Australian Skeptics newsletter, and you can sign up for that by visiting www.skeptics.com 
www.ngo.org.au Yalan savar. Karanlığa lanet okumaktansa bir mum yakmak yeğedir. Yalan Savar ekibi bir grup skeptik ve bilim tutkununun bir araya gelmesiyle oluşmuş gönüllü bir ekip olup amacı toplumda eleştirel düşünce alışkanlığını yaymak ve muhtelif asılsız iddiaları irdelemektir. Bu bölümde bahsettiğimiz konulara ve farklı pek çok yazımıza yalansavar.org adresindeki web sitemizden ulaşabilirsiniz. Sosyal medyada bizi Yalan Savar kullanıcı adıyla Twitter'dan ve Facebook sayfamızdan takip edebilir. Farklı konularda hazırladığımız video ve görüntülü sohbetleri ise Yalan Savar'ın YouTube kanalından izleyebilirsiniz. Bizimle iletişim kurmak isterseniz lütfen yalansavar.gmail.com adresinden bize e-posta gönderin. Bir sonraki bölümde görüşmek dileğiyle sağlıcakla kalın. It's time once again to look into the pages of Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia. This is the online portal with, I guess, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages of news and information from the past, all digitised from Australian newspapers, gazettes, journals and so on. Now, in the past, we've been looking at things like uh, Ouija boards, psychics, clairvoyance, dowsing, that sort of thing, the, the classics of skepticism, plus a very long series of investigating claims of the paranormal from the 1950s. On this week's show, we're going to look at something that I've had very little to do with over the years, and that is biorhythm. And if you, like me, didn't know much about biorhythms, let me start this segment with a look at the Skeptics Dictionary at skeptic.com, that's S-K-E-P-D-I-C dot com, Skeptics Dictionary, by Robert Carroll. Biorhythm. Biorhythms is a pseudoscientific belief that claims that our daily lives are significantly affected by rhythmic cycles overlooked by scientists who study biological rhythms. Biochronometry is the scientific study of rhythmic and biological cycles or clocks, such as the circadian. Circadian rhythms are based upon such things as our sensitivity to light and darkness, which is related to our sleep-wakefulness patterns. Biorhythms is not based upon scientific study of biological organisms. The cycles of biorhythm belief do not originate in scientific study, nor have they been supported by anything resembling a scientific study. The belief has been around for over a hundred years, and there is yet to be a scientific journal that has published a single article supporting it. There have been some three dozen studies supporting biorhythms, but each of them suffers from methodological and statistical errors. An examination of some 134 biorhythm studies has found that the belief is not valid. It is empirically testable and has been shown to be false. Now, the article is very interesting and it's quite lengthy and it shows charts and more information, but it seems to me that biorhythms can be used as a prop for readings and so on, and I'll link to that in the show notes. But let's see what the Australian newspapers and so on have had to say about biorhythms in the decades past. And one of the earliest references I could find comes from the Sunday Times in Perth, Western Australia, dated the 4th of November, 1951. If you break a record or your neck, it's due to biorhythmics. Victoria Parkman's theory. Ever heard of biorhythmics? According to a chunky, balding Swiss lawyer, Walter Schifferly, 45, 
now of Ashburton Street, Victoria Park, biorhythmics govern your future just as surely as history records your past. They determine when it's safe for a pilot to handle an aircraft, when car driving is not desirable, when an athlete is likely to break records or fail miserably, and when a student can pass an examination with honours. What's more, they indicate whether it's wise for a young couple whose biorhythmics may clash to consider matrimony. Schifferly, who practiced law in Switzerland for 13 years before migrating to Western Australia with his family 16 months ago, is convinced that biorhythmics can make a success of any business deal. With numerous authorities to support his contentions, he says that it is commonly known that despite a regular mode of life, our efficiency of mind and body changes daily. For instance... He says, it has been found that all living creatures, plants, animals, and humans have a double rhythmic movement in the organic system. Goodness. The so-called male period comprises 23 days, while the female period comprises 28 days, which has nothing to do with the menstrual cycle. It has been calculated, also, that the peak point on the male scale is the sixth day and the lowest, the 18th. In women, the peak days are the 7th and the 8th, and the lowest is the 21st and the 22nd days. To these is added a third rhythm period, known as the intellectual period of 33 days. So to put it briefly, there are three all-important bodily rhythms to be considered, mental, physical, and intellectual. From birth, each of us begins a life cycle of bodily rhythms. And these rhythms, Shifley says, work in harmony to the mirror, the opportunity for future success or failure. First, there is the minus phase, which according to scientific research is the time in which strength and energy are rebuilt. As this phase means a treat internal activity for the various organs of the body, it naturally causes a lessening in productivity and efficiency. This is when mental efficiency is low and loss of interest in everyday happenings occurs. And I'll just put in a note here to say some of the words in this copy are a little bit faded, so I'm just sort of piecing together what they say. We read on. It's the time of regeneration and renewal of faculties. Then comes the plus phase, the time of productivity, when all the reserves are completely restored and efficiency is highest. When the two plus phases coincide, sportsmen will shatter records and there's little risk of dangerous consequences. Hmm. Schifferly tells us it is advisable to undergo psychological treatment, surgical and dental operations, etc., in the plus phase. But he says the transit days from plus to minus and vice versa should be carefully avoided as these are critical days and there is less resistance to loss of blood, infections, or thrombosis and embolisms. The intellectual rhythm of 33 days, 16 and a half days plus and 16 and a half days minus, is important when assessing the right time for strenuous intellectual work. Schifferly is convinced that the knowledge of the periods is important for avoiding accidents as a rhythmogram began at birth can indicate the dangerous days in our lives. A number of medical tests provide proof, he says, of the accuracy of biorhythmic periods. Coincidence of the plus phase of the 28-day and 33-day rhythm means that the typical time of creative work in art, invention and construction, also great capacity in mental comprehension of persistence of mind in dangerous moments, will be at its highest. During the time of the minus phase in the intellectual rhythm, and perhaps at the same time in the 28-day period, 
it will be advisable to take time off for reflection on the past achievements in order to restore and renew all the resources used during the time of the minus phase. Swiss Air Force Administration found out by investigating 60 accidents, he says, that more than a third happened on the periodical days, according to Rhythmogram, later prepared, of those injured. He believes physicians and surgeons should heed patients' rhythmograms to learn the times of crisis. When he was practicing law overseas, Schifferly studied biorhythmics merely as a hobby. Now, after years of experience at handling domestic disputes, he feels that young couples can determine beforehand if they are rhythmically suited to marry. Sportsmen too, he feels, should welcome biorhythmics. Now, in reading that, I'm slightly surprised that biorhythms have sort of faded into obscurity. There's a wealth of um, things you could do with interpreting charts and looking at them and convincing people and, and so on, just like we see with astrology and tarot and, and whatever. The next time I stumbled across something to do with biorhythms in the archives comes to us from the Australian Woman's Weekly magazine, and this is dated from the 20th of December 1978, and it's like a, a short advertisement. Biorhythms. Have you just had one of those days when everything seems to go wrong? Have your own biorhythm chart for the next 12 months accurately plotted by computer and be prepared for the next bad day. The chart will allow you to see at a glance when your critical days are due. Exercise more caution on these days and reduce the chance of accidents and mistakes. Choice of two types of chart. Personal biorhythm chart, $7. One person charted for 12 months. Compatibility biorhythm chart, $12. Two people plotted side by side with compatibility rating. Simply send us your name and birth date to for compatibility chart. Enclosed check, money order or bank card number with signature. Hmm. Please allow 14 days for delivery. Send to computer charts. PO Box C192 Clarence Street, Sydney 2000. Office 12 Harris Street, Balmain 2041. I wonder what is at 12 Harris Street, Balmain at the moment. Now here's another item from the Canberra Times dated the 25th of January 1979, so not very long after that advertisement. Biorhythms theory in sport dismissed. A Brisbane scientist dismissed yesterday assertions that biorhythms being in the right phase helped athletes break world records in one word. Bunkum. Dr. Brian Quigley of the University of Queensland said that while internal body clocks might exist, there has been no proof that they affected sports performance in any pattern. He told the sports science section that research he had done showed athletes set new marks at all stages of their bodily cycles. Ron Clark, one of Australia's most prolific record breakers on the track, had performed at his peak when the three criteria, physical, emotional and intellectual, were high. But he had broken records also on critical days when the supporters of biorhythms theory said he should have run well below par. Biorhythms are not having any effect at all on when people break Australian records. Dr. Quigley said, There is just no obvious pattern. Like Clark, sprint champion Paul Narricott had broken records on double critical days and when he had been very high on his bio-cycle. Bio-cycle? When asked whether biorhythms affected the setting of sports records, he flashed the word bunkum on the lecture room screen from his slide projector. Dr. Quigley 
said he first became interested in biorhythms before the 1976 Olympic Games when he was approached by the mother of Steve Holland, the 1,500-metre swimmer. She was interested in the possible biorhythmic effects on her son's performance in Montreal and had begun investigating the theories. But his advice to her at the time was to ignore them, and it would be the same now. Dr. Quigley said that predictions of a triple high could hardly improve Holland's performance, and a triple low would have been disastrous for his morale. And the next item we find again is from the Canberra Times, dated the 19th of May 1983. No biorhythm linked to accidents. Perth. There is no evidence connecting biorhythm critical days and industrial accidents, according to a survey in Western Australia. Dr. G. Scalter and Mr. J. Weaver of the University of Western Australia conducted a study on a sawmilling company. They reported the results in Perth yesterday to the Congress of the Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science. The survey took account of all accidents reported to the company's first aid offices during the last three months of 1977 and the whole of 1978 and included 1,239 accidents involving 571 employees. Employee details such as birth dates were recorded and the critical biorhythm dates for each accident victim determined by computer. Mm -hmm. Critical days had been suggested as being associated with an increase in potential for human error and consequently with an increase in the likelihood of accidents, the researchers said. The results obtained in this study suggested that there was no relationship even when biorhythm critical days were measured in a variety of ways or when overall serious accidents were investigated. They said, The sequence of accidents observed was not different than might have been expected for accidents occurring randomly through time. And the very last mention of biorhythms in this little series comes to us from 1985 from the Canberra Times once again on the 6th of February, and it's a tiny little advertisement. Psychometry. Clairvoyant readings. Also, biorhythms. Phone 732239. Reincarnation. Have you lived before? 732239. And that's typical of a lot of the other things I found in researching biorhythms. They were... Uh, intertwined with psychic readings and uh, tarot cards and uh, astrology and that sort of thing. So there you are, a fascinating look at something that we hardly hear about at all. At all. It's like phrenology. You don't hear about that. And now biorhythms has joined the surprisingly short list in one respect of strange and uh, interesting beliefs that have been well, consigned to the dustbin of history. Thank you, the National Library of Australia and your hard-working staff who set about to digitise thousands upon thousands of magazines and newspapers and so on. And I will link to Trove in this week's show notes. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. On next week's show, the continuing Maynard interview with Dr. Brad. Next week, Maynard and Brad look at uh, flat earthers. Well, that sort of gets wrapped up in conspiracy theories, which is an important part of why people look to fake medicine. And uh, also conspiracies about COVID-19. Pete Evans, the former TV chef who we talk about often on the show, and uh, social media. And don't forget, you can check out Dr. Brad's new book, Fake Medicine, via the links in this week's show notes. Also on next week's show, in the Trove segment, we're going to look at uh, references over the years to Dr. Carl Sagan. What have the Australian press and other press in the area 
what have they been publishing or had uh, had said about Dr. Carl Sagan over the years, well, now many years ago. Also, we're going to be hearing more about the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project with the piece written by relatively new Skeptic Zone correspondent Adrian Hill. Oh, if only we could peer into the future. Well, we seem to have enough trouble peering into the past sometimes. Maybe you're like me. Maybe sometimes you'd like to go into the mythical time machine and uh, go and change the past. Correct an error or something like that. And that's the stuff of uh, science fiction novels, I'm afraid. But it does lead to very interesting thought experiments, like you go back and you correct your error, only to come back to the future where the error never existed and the ramifications. It's like the butterfly effect, I guess. And the other theory says it's happening all the time. And what we perceive as the past has only been recently created last week by some kid who invented a time machine. (laughs) But we would never know the difference. So maybe in the real past, I'm the audience and you're the podcaster. Hmm. Thank you to those people who continue to support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal at skepticzone.tv. Apart from helping pay for the ongoing costs of The Skeptic Zone, of course, um, to be frank, I use some of that money just to pay bills. Just everyday bills because of the time uh, I need to spend producing The Skeptic Zone every week. But I think it all works out very well. And my gratitude and appreciation to those people who chip in, who contribute. And if you'd like to be one of them, well, you know what to do. Click that link at skepticzone.tv. And while you're there, you can check out the other things on the page, like links to the various YouTube offerings, like uh, Michelle Bicker's Mars Logical Fallacies, or the Typewriter Time Funny Sketches, or every show of The Skeptic Zone, in fact, right there on YouTube. On that thought... And for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support The Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Hello to the afterthoughts, the people who keep listening after the music. If you're not sure what's going on, if you thought that's it, the show's over, I'm out of here. Not quite. Every week, almost every week, I roll a die. In this case, it's a 10-sided die, a D10. And you use your whatever powers you like, usually luck, to uh, predict and guess what numbers will come up. And this time, I'm going to roll the die three times. And we'll have a number out of a thousand. Why not? Here we go. But if you get the individual numbers along the way, that's great. First number coming up, predict away, is... Crunch, 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 seven. So our ultimate number will be 700 and something. Next number... It fell out. Next number... That's better. Two. 720. Here it comes. Last number, three. So today's winning number is 7,023 with the supplementary, the extra number at the end. Here it comes. Is a nine. Or we can say that number is 7,239.